It is said that knowledge is power, and with biotechnology, we can see in this presentation how it's true, where their knowledge about molecular biological processes has been brought to develop powerful analytical techniques. I'm going to talk about three of those techniques in this presentation, DNA amplification, microarray analysis, and 2D gel analysis. Now, knowledge about the uh, process of DNA amplification has been applied in a technique called the polymerase chain reaction that has revolutionized the way that we see and analyze DNA. The polymerase chain reaction allows a person to amplify specific DNA segments out of a larger DNA millions of times. It's very popular for forensic analysis, and if you've ever watched a crime show on television, you've probably seen PCR being applied to action. The process of PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, is derived simply by copying some ideas from cellular uh, DNA replication and then using this in a novel way to accomplish the replication of DNA that one desires only to uh, copy in a specific way. The advantage of PCR is that it's a very simple technique to perform. A high school student can be trained to do PCR in about an hour. It requires sequence knowledge to start, and that's one of the primary requirements of PCR, as we shall see. Now, the PCR uh, technique uses the knowledge of the sequence to design and chemically synthesize DNA primers flanking the region to be amplified. Now, I need to explain that. In a previous lecture, I talked about how DNA polymerase uses a primer to start DNA replication, and in the cell, that primer is RNA. Now, the problem with an RNA primer is it's got to be removed and then replaced by something else, and that's kind of a complicated process. If we want to replicate DNA in a test tube and we want to do it efficiently, we start with a DNA primer. And the beauty of a DNA primer is it defines a starting point for replication. And since a primer has a specific sequence, one can design that sequence and then allow it to find the right place to form base pairs, and that will define where the replication is occurring, as we shall see. To bring this process about, we have to take a target DNA. So this DNA might be, let's say, a human DNA. And this human DNA contains a region that we're interested in analyzing. Maybe it's a genetic mutation that a person has suffered that we're interested in determining what it is. In each case, we would know the sequences around the DNA that we're interested in studying. So let's say, for example, we have a person who has sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia involves a mutation within the hemoglobin gene. We know the sequences of the hemoglobin gene, but we don't know the sequences of the mutation in the middle of the gene. So we could design DNA primers that are complementary to either end of the hemoglobin gene, make those and make them so that they will now form base pairs with the end of the hemoglobin gene within the DNA. We take that target DNA, which is the person um, who has the mutation, we take their DNA, mix it with the primers, mix it with the four DNTPs, and here's the, the, the kicker, a thermostable DNA polymerase. Now we'll see in a minute why that thermostable DNA polymerase means or is important. The thermostable part means that it's resistant to denaturation by heat. Most enzymes fall apart in heat. A thermostable one does not. We take this whole system, this mixture that I've just defined to you, and we add it to something called a thermocycling system. And what a thermocycling system is, is a device that will heat up this sample and then cool it to various temperatures, as we shall see. And so this begins a process that I'm going to describe next. So we can see, for example, here, the target DNA of the person that has the mutated hemoglobin gene on top. It's a duplex DNA, and I've made it short here, but the reality is, is that we would have the entirety of that person's chromosome. So there's a lot of sequences here. The first step in the process of employing PCR is to pull the strands apart. Now, this kind of mimics what the helicase was doing in DNA replication, except for here we're physically pulling them apart. Well, how do you pull them apart? The way that you pull them apart is you heat the mixture to near boiling. When you do that, the hydrogen bonds that hold a DNA duplex together are broken, and the strands completely come apart. So the strands separate here. The second part is to cool that temperature down so that the primers that were mixed in the solution can form base pairs with their appropriate sequence. Now, if you make the primers of the right length, the only places where they will form base pairs are where you intended them to, 
on either side, in this case, of the hemoglobin gene. This process requires a specific temperature called an annealing temperature. So the thermostable uh, therm thermocycler heated the system up to boiling, and now it's cooled it down to this magical temperature where the primers will form base pairs with their complements. The third step then is for the DNA polymerase to replicate those strands. Well, the DNA polymerase was already in the mixture. And remember, we used a thermostable DNA polymerase. And because of that, it didn't get damaged by that boiling that we did. The DNA polymerase uses the four DNTPs to replicate the strand of interest. And we can see the replication now that has occurred here. So after that's happened, the primers define the ends. So I see one end in yellow, and I see another end in green. Okay. This replication proceeds, and now what happens is the primers direct replication over and over and over of the same strands. So notice that the two strands that we're copying is just the top and the bottom strand. They're actually the same sequence. So then when we get a duplex that's made from that, it means that we started with one duplex in step one, but by step three, we have two copies of that same duplex. Well, you can start to see what happens here. Every time we do a cycle of boiling, annealing, and replicating, we double the number of strands. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but if you go 30 times, you have 2 to the 30th more strands than you started with, at least in theory. That's over a billion. So that means you can take very tiny amounts of DNA and make incredible quantities of it using this method. This is why it's a very powerful tool in a crime scene. It doesn't take very much of a suspect's DNA to get this kind of analysis done. This process is typically repeated for 30 to 40 cycles, although there are some processes where it's done even more. Now, this powerful technique is one of many that we use to analyze uh, sequences. So, for example, analyzing DNA is done by PCR, but there's other types of analyses that we're interested in doing. And these types of analyses I like to sort of lump together and call omics analyses. We'll see how that comes into play in just a moment. The technological advances really are what have made the uh, omics analyses possible. Omics methodologies r focus on individual molecules within a cell, but across a broad spectrum. So what happens, for example, if we talk about genomics, there's one of the omics, we're studying every DNA sequence in a cell. Now, 30 years ago, that was inconceivable. Nobody knew how to do that. Now we can sequence a genome in a very short period of time, a week. We can do transcriptomics, in which we're analyzing all of the transcripts of a cell. Now, the transcripts, of course, are the RNAs that are being transcribed for making protein. If we know all of the RNAs of a cell and how many of each is being made, we have an amazingly broad piece of information about what the cell is doing and how much of it it's trying to make. Proteomics is a another one of the omics that's involved in the study of protein expression. So just like we can use transcriptomics to tell us how many and what kinds of RNAs are being made, proteomics allows us to determine how many and how much of each protein is being made in a cell. So metabolomics is an analysis of the metabolome. The metabolome, of course, corresponds to all the metabolites that are being made in a cell. That could include all the molecules made in the citric acid cycle, and what quantity of each is being made, all of the molecules being made in glycolysis, and what the quantities of each of th those are. In other words, all of the different biochemistry that's happening spectrally across the entire cell. Now, that's the advantage of, an, of omics type analyses. And there are dozens of omics disciplines now that people have uh, developed to do these kinds of analyses. And as a result of this, we're actually able to understand at a system level what's happening in the cell instead of understanding at an individual molecular level what's happening in the cell. And what happens with that systems analysis allows us to better understand what life is really all about. Microarrays are also powerful tools in an analysis known as the genome-wide analysis of sequences, or GWAS. 
In this type of use of microarrays, small nucleotide polymorphisms, also known as SNPs, are used as probes, and these probes help the analysis in the analysis to tell if a person has one of these single nucleotide polymorphisms or a mutation in a relevant gene. Using information from GWAS, a person can determine if a person, first of all, has a um, um, single nucleotide polymorphism, and then if that single nucleotide polymorphism correlates with the presence of a genetic disease.